Uh, welcome to State of the Net 2022. Um, we're really glad to have you today for a great panel on kids, cashless apps, and COPPA, uh, who's protecting kids' fintech privacy. Um, this is an issue that's as prescient as ever, as everyone in the room knows. Um, screen time usage of apps like these has really soared during the pandemic. Uh, you know, with added screen time, we see additional interactions with different platforms and inevitably more business transactions that kids are engaging in. Um, and so looking forward to having a discussion today about uh, the laws that are on the books to protect kids as they're engaging in these transactions and engaging with fintech and uh, what more policymakers and uh, private actors could be doing to protect children. Um, and so I'm joined by a terrific panel of experts today that have been working on this issue all for a long time. Uh, uh, we have Jamie Suskind, who is a tech policy advisor for Senator Marsha Blackburn, who is the ranking member on the Senate Commerce Consumer Protection Committee. She previously worked at the Consumer Technology Association and at the FCC. Uh, we have Jessica Rich, who is of counsel at the law firm Kelly Dry, and she previously served at the Federal Trade Commission in various roles, including director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Uh, we have Sid Terry, who is the chief of staff to Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, who chairs the House Energy and Commerce Committee's Consumer Protection Panel, and he previously served as her legislative director. Uh, and, and lastly, but not least, we have Rick Lane, CEO of Iggy Ventures, uh, he previously served as Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at 21st Century Fox. So I, I wanted to, to kick off the discussion today by, by talking a little bit about what makes uh, fintech and these issues around financial um, transactions distinct. And so I'm wondering, perhaps we can just go down the line, and um, I'd like to hear what you all think are distinct um, concerns, issues, challenges posed by uh, fintech uh, when it comes to children's privacy. So, Jamie, would you like to start off? Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, first of all, thanks to State of the Net for having me today. I'm happy to join all these um, really great panelists. Uh, yeah, so I would say um, for anyone who's been following my boss um, since she started in the Senate, uh, moved over from the House, she's talked about how um, consumer privacy is one of her probably the biggest focus for her um, in the tech space. And also um, for the past several years, she's been talking about the importance of uh, kids' privacy and kids' safety online. Um, and as we start thinking about this, we um, had had occasion to start thinking a bit about um, the financial space and learning more about how kids are starting to use financial apps, things like Venmo, kids are getting debit cards, which in and of itself, you know, this doesn't seem like a problem. I have a daughter, she's going to be um, five soon, you know, maybe when she hits about 12 is the time that I would start thinking, okay, you know, I could teach her how to use a debit card, how to use, um, you know, financial apps, you know, so she can learn about um, sort of being, um, you know, financially responsible, things like that. Um, but at the same time, we started to think about how it seems like there's this gap there where the existing um, privacy laws that are out there don't really seem to cover or anticipate this issue, right? I mean, Graham Leach Bliley seems to assume um, that you would be uh, not a minor, right? It doesn't seem like you would ever think that a minor would be using something like a debit card or a credit card, or at least back then you probably wouldn't have thought about, you know, them using financial apps, um, COPPA obviously exists, right? There's a consent regime, but at the same time, um, you know, it's there and it's sort of like the bare bones notice and consent type stuff. But at the same time, it's like it, it might not be anticipating sort of the wealth of financial information that and other things, location data, things like that, that kids could be providing to these apps um, on a real time basis. So, um, you know, I think that this is a really interesting area in general, right? Kids' privacy is a really interesting area for us. So just happy to chat about it some more. It's great to be here um, talking about uh, kids' privacy and um, data, apps, etc. cetera. Um, I think that um, um, there are a bunch of concerns that are raised by these uh, tools. First, there is comprehensive data collection um, you know, it's not just your, your, your personal data, it's your financial tra transactions, it's your location data. Um, the several laws apply. 
CAPA applies, GLB applies, but not comprehensively and not adequately. And one key area that's a gap is uh, tween, teens or tweens. Um, and by the way, GLB and CAPA, the main laws that apply, were both passed in about 2000. I, was, I did the first rulemaking under CAPA, and my 24-year-old son had just been born. Um, uh, the um, kids, and this is true in other areas too, but kids are far more sophisticated about apps um, and, and the controls on them than their parents are. So these models that um, assume parents are going to control for their kids are, are, are very outdated. And uh, the final thing I'll say is that to the extent that these laws um, are not adequate, part of that is that the way we have been approaching privacy with notice and choice is not adequate because once uh, people click through these annoying screens and pop-ups um, and say, yeah, sure, because they're not really focusing on what's going on. That's not, the, that's not the, their focus at the moment. They just want to use an app. Anything goes. Our, our notice and choice laws, that's basically what they do. Uh, so they don't provide, uh, even when it's a very compre comprehensive and notice and choice, people are inclined to just click through, and it just really doesn't provide the protections that are needed. Uh Thanks, Jessica, and thanks, everyone, for being here. And uh, it's very humbling to be on this uh, distinguished panel. Um, I'll kind of go uh, uh, just build off a lot of what Jessica just said, um, you know, and, and actually what Jamie said, too, about uh, the idea of getting people a debit card or, or for your kids or whatever. Um, you know, I think in many ways that was, you know, having a, a, a teenager with a credit card or a debit card was sort of a high class problem in the past, you know, something that wealthier parents would be doing. Um, but I think that in many ways, pandemic, as well as the apps, have made that a much more universal issue and have brought to the front the need that we have to really think critically and to uh, step into the space. Um, I I'll sort of make a little bit broader comment beyond that. I mean, I think that one thing that, you know, we, we on the uh, Democrats in the House Energy and Commerce Committee, particularly the Consumer Protection Subcommittee, pretty, pretty much feel universally that the idea that we more or less treat uh, as adults, children 14 and up, is a fairly major flaw, especially with like kind of the, for lack of a better term, great power that the internet has. You know, I mean, the internet at this point where we stand now, as kind of Jessica noted, is both our past, present, and future, right? Web one, web two, web three. Um, but, you know, when I was 14, 15 years old, if I wanted to do something either good or bad, I had to go down to the, to the computer in the basement at my parents' house. I had to dial up I had to search for something and let it load. Usually I'd go do something else. It would take so long to load the page I wanted to do and then come back to it. I mean, again, these, these, again, the good and the bad is all at their fingertips now on their phones. So we really need to be thinking about that. But the other thing that I really think about in terms of this loophole is the way in which it can allow for, for targeting of, of kids um, and tweens, as, as Jessica noted. I think back, uh, we had a hearing in September 2020 uh, at which uh, Tim Kendall, who was the first revenue officer at Facebook and later the head of Pinterest, spoke. Um, and in my boss's uh, testimony, there was a Vice article shortly before that where a Facebook engineer said uh, of the group algorithms feature were the quote-unquote scariest feature of the platform, the darkest manifestation. A user enters into one group and Facebook essentially pigeonholes them into a lifestyle they can never get out of. Well, now that sounds hyperbolic, and it perhaps is, and who knows why that employee was talking to Vice in the first place, it's important to remember that they're talking about adults in that case. They're not talking about kids. And I think if we all think back to what we were like when we were 14 or 15, I think we have to really think about, you know, and, and think about this in terms of cigarettes. And that was what Tim Kendall did at that very hearing. Like, you know, we recognize that, that those years are habit forming and can, and can be built and, and can shape you who you are for the rest of your life. And by allowing for companies who may not always have the best intentions, I know many of the ones, that, all the ones that are here surely do, um, but, but who may not have the best intentions to be able to target our children like that, I think is a huge oversight and something that needs rectifying quickly. And that's, I'll leave it there. And I just have to note that you look way too young to use dialect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I feel really old because I remember having my son using dial-up and showing him how to use the internet. Um, so that's really kind of scary in of itself. And now he works up on Capitol Hill. Um, but the, for me, um, when I left Fox, um, I wanted to do something good. And so I decided to volunteer my time to advise um, online child safety groups on tech policy. Uh, I felt 30 years of experience could help them, um, and they don't have the resources to compete with you know, the professional lobbyists in this town who are really good and really smart, um, but may have a different view on some of these tech policy issues. Um, I worked on the FOSTA-SESTA legislation, working on Section 230 reform, Earn It Act, as well as the dark who is GDPR problem that's putting our national security at risk. Um, I was approached about a year and a half ago by Rego, which is the company that is the parent company of the Missoula app. And they wanted to talk to me about this app that they were rolling out that helped protect kids' privacy. And we hear a lot of these you know, companies that are out there. And once they explained to me what they were trying to do, here I'm supposed to be a child privacy advocate and expert, and I had never thought of the simple fact that when I got my kids' credit cards that... I didn't opt out of anything, that they had been tracked since the age of 14 all the way now through adulthood with every credit card purchase they've made with their social security numbers, their name, their date of birth, everything to create a dossier. And then this light bulb went on and said, imagine once that financial transactions get combined with your social networking history. You have a dossier on kids before they hit 18 that is second to none and nothing that we have ever seen or foreseen as we were looking at COPPA and GLBA. So when Rigo was showing me their tech, I was like, oh my gosh, a technological solution that solves a public policy problem. And I, one of the people I reached out to was Jessica. I was like, what, you know, have you thought about this? <laughs> like, we're, you know, we're kind of been in the same world. When I was doing MySpace, Jessica and I would have conversations all the time. How do we protect kids on MySpace? Never thinking, oh, what about their financial transactions? So working with the, you know, members in the House and the Senate and others, one of the things I'm real excited about this event is to really bring this issue to the forefront because it's not an issue that we really have spoken about since the 98 passage of COPPA and the 99 passage of GLBA. Um, I realized a couple minutes ago that I never introduced myself. I'm Cristiano Lima, technology reporter with the Washington Post. I write our Tech 202 newsletter. First live event in a couple years, folks. Um, so I wanted to, to turn, and Jessica, you alluded to this, but um, you mentioned that you, you think there are uh, gaps in the existing laws. And, and you mentioned the cutoffs, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you see as existing gaps in COPPA and then also uh, Graham Leach Bliley and other. Um, standards that we have around this? Well, I think it's, I think it's important to understand, um, first, what does exist, because I think there's a lot of confusion around that. So maybe could I just start with that? So, so I think the main laws that apply in this space, and I'm talking U.S., and I'm talking commercial, you know, is COPPA, which is parental consent for the collection, use of disclosure of information, for kids under 13. Then there's GLB, which allows uh, people to opt out of third-party sharing, but not with affiliates, which is a big loophole. And that would apply to all people, including kids. So there's an overlap there. There's, two, um, there's also the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair and deceptive practices and provides the FTC with a lot of flexibility to protect kids even outside of those sectoral laws. And then there are state laws, and one in particular, California uh, adds a consent for third-party sharing with 13 to 16 and a lot of other uh, state laws in the, in the pipeline that may address kids. And then, of course, there are proposals like um, Jamie's uh, uh, boss's uh, recent proposal uh, for for minors. Um, but it's very important to know that COPPA does, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not up to the task today, but it does have a lot of protections that parents can use if they're paying attention. It applies to this space. Um, not only can the FTC enforce it, but all the banking reg regulators can enforce it because the FTC lacks jurisdiction over banks, but it does allow the banking reg regulators to also enforce it. But 
Um, it applies to these apps. It applies not only to the apps themselves, but to third parties that collect information through these apps. Um, it's in, uh, it's, it has notice on the website and directly to parents, alerting parents that, that data collection may be going on. It's got parental consent requirements um, that, that have some teeth, but also have some flaws because, uh, for example, using a credit card is considered a form of parental consent. So if a parent doesn't want a kid to just use their credit card to say, my parent consented, um, they're, they're going to need to be paying attention. Um, and, you know, with, I don't want to go on too long, but, um, oh, parents can get access to data that's collected about their kids. And then, as I said, GLB also provides some tools. So the reason this is inadequate is it's fundamentally based on the notice and choice model, um, which if you're not paying attention, you just run right through it, and then all, all you know, it's, it's a free-for-all. And it doesn't, uh, COPPA doesn't extend to teens or tweens. So we do need new laws, um, and um, I guess that's my summary of it uh, for now. <laughs> And if I could just jump in and say, and then channel 100% my boss here, but I mean, one of the things that you kind of, that I, my big takeaway from your really helpful run through there, Jessica, was that uh, the burden is on parents in this case, yeah. right? And so well-educated, often well-to-do parents are going to be able to protect their children, but many others are not going to have that opportunity, nor even know that they're missing that opportunity, right? And that's where I think we need, that's kind of what the paradigm shift has to take place in our laws, would you, right? To, to the extent that parents have access to uh, the internet and, and sophistication about the tools, uh, they can do this regardless of income. But uh, many lower income parents need, both don't have the time because they're working double jobs and they may not have access to these tools. Can I also? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, I think all those points are right. So my boss, along with Senator Blumenthal, who chairs the Consumer Protection Subcommittee, they held five hearings over the last year, um, bringing in a lot of the big players in this space. They brought in YouTube, they brought in TikTok, they brought in Instagram, they brought in Facebook, which I guess is now Meta. Um, we brought in Snapchat. So they've had everybody up there. They had the Facebook whistleblower, um, you know, and basically what we've seen is that regardless of COPPA, it seems like a lot of these companies are either willfully or perhaps, I guess, negligently disregarding COPPA, right? I mean, we saw a lot of documents that showed that Facebook was actively recruiting kids under 13 to the platform using siblings to do it. And so it seems like, you know, I'm a Republican, right? I mean, my boss is a Republican. We're not looking to create a nanny state, but it's very tough for parents to be working in sort of a good faith way when the companies are not. And it seems like, you know, me as a parent, right, and I'm, I work in this space, right, I feel like I'm knowledgeable in this space, but even I probably would miss things that sort of an everyday parent, you know, living in the Midwest would never even think to look for, particularly when these companies are trying to actively flout, you know, the rules in COPPA now. So that's why my boss and Senator Blumenthal recently introduced a bill um, I would say that we should not necessarily get rid of COPPA, but at the same time, I acknowledge, as Jessica says, that when it comes to kids and, you know, what do we call it, tween safety, that there definitely is um, a major gap here and that there's more that needs to happen. You know, there's parental um, safety features that, you know, can be put on by default. There are safety audits that can be taking place. There's age verifications that they need to, frankly, do a better job of doing. Um, I recognize that some of these companies will say, hey, we're doing the best that we can and we can't help it if kids lie. But if nothing else, it's like you're trying to collect the age data based on the data that you already collect. You should be setting things more. I mean, we saw that, for example, Instagram said that um, you know, kids and teens' profiles should automatically be defaulted to private. And then we saw that that actually wasn't happening. It's things like that that we need to be thinking about. Um, in addition to COPPA, I mean, certainly the Hill is talking about whether COPPA works, whether COPPA should be updated, but there's more than that that needs to be happening. Um, and like I said, you know, we're not looking to create a nanny state, but we also recognize that parents are... Um, 
you know, in a way, like they're working at odds with companies that are, um, you know, able to pull one over on them, frankly, and that parents are stressed. It's been a pandemic. Parents are working. Kids are at home. They're just trying to figure out what to do. Um, and so, you know, we think that there's just, there's more that needs to be done to protect kids' safety online here. So you mentioned that um, you think that there are companies that are, that are flaunting the, the standards on the book. So, so putting a pin in the uh, potential changes to the laws that exist. I mean, how much of the issue here is enforcement and the extent to which, I mean, we've, we've heard from kid safety advocates for years that they wish that um, COPPA and these standards would be more uh, rigorously enforced. So how much of that do you think is part of the issue? Yeah, I mean, and obviously Jessica spent many years at FTC, but I do think that there's more enforcement that needs to happen. I don't, so I don't happen to agree that the answer is getting rid of the safe harbors in COPPA. She may have a different view, but I do think that it would be nice to see more enforcement. But at the same time, um, when we have, you know, Facebook coming up there and saying, well, we just re removed 800,000 underage accounts. Like, how do you get 800,000 underage accounts on your platform in the first place? Um, so, you know, we need to be really thinking about sort of the protections that are in place on the front end so we don't have to rely on the FTC in every case to be, you know, enforcing against 800,000 accounts. If I can yeah, just add. I see you gearing up over there. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, it, one of the things about COPPA that I early on, you know, always was a strong supporter of is the self-regulatory regime of having these secondary entities that are certified by the Federal Trade Commission to help in this enforcement side. Um, I do think that that can be stepped up and there can be greater scrutiny of the self-regulatory regimes that are out there. We're very proud at Missoula and Rigo that we are COPPA certified. We took that very seriously. We built privacy from the ground up, working with Prevo and others to make sure that we have the regimes in place. And that's very helpful for parents. Um, I always looked at that as sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval so that you wouldn't have to worry about the 800,000 companies that are out there and hoping and crossing your fingers are doing the right thing, that there was a mechanism that could help guide parents but also hold these companies accountable. So I hope that stays um, in place. The, the other thing I just want to make sure is that the digital wallets and debit cards are a good thing. The fintech world, as we heard from Congressman McCall, you know, it can be pluses and minuses, just like you know, digital currencies and Bitcoin and, and all the other issues that are out there. We just need to make sure we have it in place. But one of the positive things as we're heading into um, you know, the Financial Literacy Month is that there's a lot of great products that fintech can be helpful on and, we, and to help kids learn how to manage money, to get chores, um, to donate to charities, and a few other functionalities that Missoula and other digital um, financial apps do. But at the same time, you don't want the, all that information collected on these kids of what they're doing and their financial literacy. So providing tools to help kids in this cashless society and learn about financial literacy is critically important. The question here is what are the rules of the road in this fintech world to protect kids' privacy and their financial privacy? Yeah. I just want to note for uh, especially the press here that we, uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, led by Congresswoman Castor, who's kind of our, our lead along with Ms. Trahan, uh, Ms. Rice, and Ms. Dingle on kids' issues, uh, conducted oversight on all these third-party companies, and I believe we have all of our responses back from them. If any of them are here or watching and you haven't gotten it back, this is me guilting you. Uh, but so no, I didn't. think that we're going to be, we're, we're, we're kind of evaluating this space right now. And, and if there are other people here who have uh, insights and we have not reached out to you, we'd welcome those uh, at this time. So um, can, can I make a point about well, the, the, something that is particularly challenging in this area is knowing when you are dealing with a kid. And COPPA um, may be too porous in that it's, kid-directed sites, and then uh, you're, uh, you're, if you're a kid-directed site, you're covered, or if you're a site that no, has actual knowledge, you're dealing with a kid. So um, your bill um, deals with it differently. Uh, it covers, it provides protections when uh, the covered entities, uh, uh, when, when somebody's reasonably likely to be, when, 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 when the site is reasonably likely to be used by a minor or when the uh, entity that owns the site, that operates the site or the app, reasonably believes 
they're dealing with a minor. Those are difficult standards, too. And so for all you researchers out there, I think getting this right is going to require that knowledge standard, that that standard for when you're responsible, when you know you're dealing with a kid to be adjusted properly so we get the proper coverage. It's a very challenging area. Yeah, so I, I'd love to dig into some of the proposals that you all referenced. Um, obviously, both the House Energy and Commerce Committee and the, and the Senate Commerce Committee have been very active on this. Um, uh, Sid, there, I know you all are holding a hearing around you know, tech accountability tomorrow. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, how you all see this particular piece um, around kids' privacy, fintech fitting into your agenda um, there. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're still reviewing the uh, the. Blumenthal Blackburn proposal. Uh, that being said, um, when you have uh, Senator Blumenthal and Senator Blackburn coming together, it gets a lot of attention. Um, and so we're, we're reviewing it really, really closely. Um, that being said, uh, you know, again, I, me- I mentioned Ms. Castor uh, and uh, kind of the other members who she's working with. They have a proposal out there that we uh, Democrats like a lot. I think our minority counterparts aren't as enthralled with it, but I I could be wrong, but either way, I think we see this as being uh, a key part of a comprehensive privacy bill. We're looking to kind of, you know, it was announced in November that we made a proffer to the minority there on that. Um, You know, the base text for that would be at this point, the Castor bill uh, from our perspective, but obviously we expect that to be negotiated Um, and, you know, we'll see where it goes. But, you know, in our, our message to everybody here would be, um, that we view the uh, the Blumenthal Blackburn bill as um, as a live a live issue, and uh, you know our view our hope would be that um, we could use that as a springboard to a comprehensive privacy bill. But again, I don't think we're going to hold it up or wait for that either. Yeah, so, so that's interesting. And, and B- Jamie, maybe if you want to speak to this, um, you know, the, there's there have been questions for a long time about whether um, lawmakers should move ahead on this idea of a comprehensive privacy bill. Uh, move ahead on a more distinct proposal that's focused on updating COPPA. Um, it, it seems that, uh, Sid, you, you, you think that maybe it should should be rolled into that comprehensive proposal. But, Jamie, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are on that. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I'm not at liberty to share the discussions my boss is having with other members, but I, you know, she has said publicly, right, like, let's get them all done. I don't think she views this bill as a substitute for comprehensive consumer privacy. She thinks, uh, I mean, she would tell you she's on TV all the time talking about it, right? That is, I think, one of the most important things that she thinks that Congress needs to get done as soon as possible. Um, Obviously, this is also a really top priority, but, uh, you know, I don't think that that changes her calculus about the importance of consumer privacy. So, you know, I think if I were channeling her, she'd say, well, let's get it all done. (laughs) Um, And so uh, I want to dig into a couple of the specific um, aspects of legislation that you all have mentioned. Um, The the age cutoffs in COPPA, um, there are a number of different um, standards uh, across uh, CCPA in California, GDPR, um, the UK's age-appropriate design code that all um, would potentially boost um, or have boosted protections um, for not just children, but also tweens, teens to an extent. I'm wondering if you all could speak to um, which protections you think should be, if at all, to be expanded um, beyond the current um, federal U.S. standards and which ones you think should be kept in place. And that's for, for anyone. Yeah, go ahead. My, my personal view is that we should start at age 17 and under. Um, that I think, you know, as a parent has gone through it, you know, I thought when I was 17 I knew everything. Um, it's just typical being 17. Um, but they're going to make mistakes, and you don't want them making life-altering mistakes, as I like to say. Um, so I think it should be 17 and younger, but I understand that compromises need to be made, and, so, and it looks like there's a consensus around 16. Um, and if we can get really secure protections at that age, you know, again, compromise is the name of the game in this town if you want to get legislation through, especially in the privacy area. But I also am concerned about, like, I love Venmo. I use it all the time. I think it's great. I don't understand why people allow others to see their transactions. That just baffles the heck out of me. I, I, you know, I'm looking at my phone and my Venmo and people are, like, saying what they gave their kids money for and their friends. 
I don't get that, but they want to do that. That is their right. But when they're 17 and under, that is a little more troubling um, because that's open data. That's the data that can be scraped. That's the data that can be used by others who are not even part, as we've seen with Facebook and other social networking sites where they're scraped, that that information can be used for somebody who's younger, who thinks they know everything and who cares because I'm 17, I'm going to be 17 forever. So I think those are some of the areas that we need to look at. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll sound a bit like a broken record. I think that our official position at this point is the uh, is the caster bill, which I believe takes it up to 17. Um, and uh, and I think that we'd all also want to take a hard look at the issues that are being raised here as well. Um, but again, I'm going to sound like I said, like it's like a broken record. Uh, Blackburn Blumenthal has definitely got a lot of attention. Um, so um, a chief element of any uh, bill needs to be that it's enforceable. And I do see in the UK code and even the bill that, that you guys have, the, the Blumenthal um, Blackburn bill, some elements that would be very difficult to enforce that I think there needs to be meat on the bones. For example, a general duty of care, it will be very hard for any agency to enforce. And so there needs to be a little more uh, fleshing out of what that means. Um, I do think there need to be some special controls for tweens or whatever we're calling them. But um, uh, more work needs to be done on what happens if both the tweens and the parents try to implement those controls at the same time. And otherwise, there's this terrible battle and the tweens are going to win, um, uh, at least in my house. Um, yeah, and I, I do strongly believe, I don't have a view on 16 or 17, but you know, that the, the 13 to 16 um, should have some special protections. Um, so uh, we've alluded to the, the UK's age-appropriate design code. There was recently legislation introduced in California that basically seeks to export some of those protections and um, create a framework that mirrors that um, in the U.S. context. Um, but, but more broadly, I'm wondering if you think that that is an approach, um, and again, I'll, I'll open this up to anyone, um, that other states um, should be looking to emulate or uh, what, if anything, we should be um, taking from other standards on this uh, featured in, in GDPR or CCPA? No states. Don't do it. Uh, Jessica and I had a conversation right before this panel about, um, you know, whether our bill had intended to preempt states. I mean, I think that's probably the clear intent. We just you know, I think in our view, we didn't need to put the language in, but, you know, uh, perhaps we do need to put the language in. I think but that not it's now. no, not, <laughs> not right now, not today. But, um, yeah, I think it would get very messy, particularly given the way that companies are structured. Um, and maybe that's just me, you know, belying my Republican preemption, preemption. Right. But we need we need not for states to do this. And, and let me run this out a little bit. Um, if there are aspects of those proposals that you think should also feature in a federal bill. So let me just reiterate that I do believe the UK code would be difficult to just enforce, to take straight to enforcement um, because the uh, it's written like a best practices document. And as a former longtime enforcer, I would have a hard time um, using that to to go to court. Um, but um, you could combine an approach like the UK code with um, safe harbors um, that where um, uh, groups could put meat on the bones, could interpret the, that kind of code um, specific to particular industries. And then um, people who uh, enter those safe harbors who, who who are willing to be part of those programs would make pledges to comply with those more specific standards, which would then be uh, enforceable and more specific. So I, I want to turn a little bit to, we, we've talked a lot about um, the, the regulatory side. Um, I'm wondering, I want to talk a little bit about what private actors, companies could be doing to, to boost um, children's privacy around uh, fintech financial transactions. Um, I'd love to, to go down the line and, and hear if you all can think uh, of an example of a company in the private sector that you think is taking some um, positive steps um, to address some of these issues um, and that you think other companies should potentially be emulating. 
or if anyone, whoever wants to jump in. Well, I know that when my kids were tweens, um, we used a, a payment card that had limited features. Um, so there was only so it didn't, it was a, uh, I think it was a credit union. Um, no, it was USAA. Not that I'm trying to advertise for anyone, but you know, it did, it didn't, it didn't track them in a, in a comprehensive way. They, there was only so much they could do with the, the, the cards, but they were able to pay for things and they could deal with it in an emergency. So that seems like a very basic way to approach, uh, not that I'm sure we would want to legislate that, but, uh, there could be options for parents so that they don't sign kids up for a data collection machine. You know, it's actually hard for me to say uh, of a company that's doing a good job. I know Rick has has flagged his company. That's, that I just heard about them fairly recently. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would just, as an anecdote, um, one of our staffers was an engineer at a big tech company, social media company, who did GDPR implementation. And uh, they told me and our whole office, basically, that uh, the company basically made a blank announcement that they did not have any users under 13, um, and therefore they did not have to worry about COPPA. And that's, they had no actual knowledge. Yeah. Cor- correct. And, and, and I think that that's a lot what Jamie was kind of talking about earlier. And so, uh, you know, given uh, the, the size and power of the company that, that she came from, uh, that suggests to me that, that was, that's, a, that's a common industry practice. So I'm not really – I think I, we really ought to be more trying to press them on this issue instead of, um, instead of uh, you know, praising anybody at this point. So I'm a little biased here, obviously, um, working with Missoula and knowing what they have done in this space. Um, you know, this is a commercial for them, though. No. Um, <laughs> but the, the ability of building privacy from the ground up and, and ensuring the protection of kids is what you should be looking for. Um, I think, you know, I protect my own personal name brand um, with, uh, you know, with a lot of effort to ensure that, you know, when I am working with an entity or groups that they, people know that I truly believe in what those companies are doing. And working closely with Missoula, I know that their hearts and their minds are in the right place. When they started this company, this company was actually started in 2008. Um, when they began looking at this issue way before the pandemic. You know, the technology has been in development those years. And now we're, I always look, it's a very old, it's like the old saying, you know, we, I, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. Um, and I think Missoula and Rigo is in that space right now. And again, when they came to me um, and looking what they did, it's all the things that we always talk about um, from a policy standpoint of what companies need to do. And Rigo, Missoula, with their Missoula um, pay button, which is like an Apple pay button or a Google, um, an Android or Google pay button um, on sites and all these things, it, it's what companies should be doing. And we're trying to become the standard that other companies are trying to reach. So I won't list a company um, in part. It probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to. But um, number one, the example you cited was on the show Silicon Valley for anyone who watched that. So <laughs> um, it's real and it tracks. Um, but I would say, right, as a matter of principles, we should be thinking about things like data minimization for kids, um, you know, limiting the data transfers for kids, right? A lot of the companies, I mean, I will throw a TikTok under the bus because my boss would let me throw a TikTok under the bus. But if you read their privacy policy, that's scary. They're collecting a lot of things that probably you all as adults would not want collected on you. Um, You know, also query what they do with it, but that's a lot of things and our kids are on it and our kids are pretty much addicted to it, you know, kids in the U.S. And that's a lot of information that is not, I'm not comfortable with, you know, having collected on kids and teens. So... So we're actually coming up on time, and I, I do want to give a chance for the audience to ask any questions. Um, Duncan, over here, uh, in just a minute, I want to ask uh, just one more question to the panel. But uh, if after this question is done, if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question to our panelists, um, we'll run out a mic to you. Um, j- just the la- last question um, f- um, for me. Um, so, uh, you know, humor me and, and say that you were made um, omnip- omnipotent ruler of all things privacy for a day. Um, in the U.S., what what would be the single most um, significant change um, you think could be made, whether it's um, uh, something private 
sector companies could be doing, uh, something regulators should be doing, or a change to existing standards? What, what would be the most impactful? Oh, my Lord. Um, <laughs> 22 years I've been involved in monitoring co congressional um, actions on privacy. Uh, in 2000, I was the manager that, um, that, that was responsible for, for a report to Congress calling on Congress to pass comprehensive privacy legislation. 22 years of hearings and bills, et cetera, we need that so badly. The mess that we have today is in large part due to Congress's, it's not you personally, <laughs> failure, to, <laughs> failure to act all these years. And so we, we need a comprehensive approach. I agree. <laughs> I'll just, I'll go really quickly. I think that uh, a ban on cross-app tracking and a um, opt-in consent model would be the most impactful things. I mean, being a public policy person and having worked uh, on all these years on the privacy issue in general, I mean, let's face it, there's two major hurdles that Congress has to overcome, federal preemption and private right of action. Those are the hurdles. And unless we come to some type of an agreement, which we did just in the Can Spam Act, I always thought that was a, it shows you how old I am because I worked on the Can Spam Act. Um, but it was a model that I thought could, could work. The other thing I think, if I was able to implement legislation, is the ability, making it illegal, except for in certain circumstances, to re anonymize data. I think that's also a big loophole because you can take quote, anonymous data and re-anonymize it. We saw that with research that was done when there was, when there was a big data link. So having restrictions on re-anonymizing you know, re data, I think would also be key. So federal preemption, strong federal preemption, so we can have one um, having some, dealing with the private right of action in a way that makes sense and giving states the ability to enforce um, and dealing with the anonymized data and the re-anonymization of data. So if anyone has questions, if you want to just raise your hand, we'll, we'll run out of mic to you. So we talked a lot about teens and tweens privacy and that oftentimes while we hear this debate um, discusses children privacy, we're actually talking about much older children or teenagers. Um, how do you balance the trade-offs between the fact that we have children or teenagers in this range that are trying to seek information that they may not want their parents to know about with also ensuring that there is parental choice and that parents are well educated around the tools that are available to them. So you all may have other feelings, but you know, I think in our bill, we tried to balance that. I mean, we raised the age to 16, which I think for companies, they told us that would be easier in terms of compliance with existing regimes like GDPR. But at the same time, um, you know, the parental controls are there by default, but can be turned off. Um, you know, I think that that's important that the parents and the kids be able to work together to be able to say, you know, hey, I'm mature enough, right? When I was a kid, frankly, my parents would never have deigned to put controls on to me, right? But, you know, to be able to say, okay, you know, I don't need my profile set to private. I don't need to have this particular control in place, right? Or the parent can just kind of do that knowing that their kid is mature enough, right? Um, and I would also say, right, that certainly our intent is not to apply to sites like, for example, Wikipedia, right? I mean, it, if that's how you all read it, I'm happy to clarify that that's not the case. But um, certainly it's not meant to apply to, like, general usage research type sites where kids should be able to go and, you know, research and look up other things that are sort of outside of the, this is a child intended site. A great question. And that's always the balance as a parent, right? When do you track your kids when they're driving, you know, or the first time they're riding a bike and go in the neighborhood, it's scary to let go. And, you know, the first time they go to school and do you follow them to school? Um, that's the age old question of being a parent of those balancing. And so having the tools in an op that are set on helps in that because parents, what I hear in my online, the child safety groups, is parents don't know how to turn the tools on. They're very complicated, and they're unsure what to do. And we always hear this refrain that my kids know more than I do about the technology, and they've been saying that for 20 years, and now the people who are saying it are the kids who are you know, now adults and have kids. Um, and so I think there's that balancing. There are tools out there. 
um, like SafetyNet and others who have looked at that. I would highly recommend you look at those. I have no financial interest in SafetyNet. Um, but they're a UK entity, and they try to balance that where the privacy versus notifying parents when there's maybe cyberbullying. I think there's Bark is another one that is out there that has some of these tools. So there's, there's tools out there. But I am working on the Earn It Act. And one of the things that was very disappointing when Apple flip-flopped on their announcement, what bothered me is that they were saying parents don't have a right to know when their teenagers have nude pictures and CSAM going across their phones. I think that's an easy one. Yes, as a parent, if it's CSAM, which is illegal, I think I should know as a parent. Um, and, I, and I was disappointed that Apple decided to flip on that with some pressure. But other issues of research and Wikipedia and finding other information of your own sexuality and things like that, I think, again, that's where parents need to trust their kids and have some latitude in doing so. Um, so you, you've hit on a, a critical issue, which also fed into what I was saying about, you know, the battling controls, you know, um, and it's one of the reasons that we, that Congress, with the FTC's input, originally did the under 13, although um, sometimes I joke it's just about, that was bar mitzvah age, and that somebody <laughs> just, uh, just chose it for that. Um, I think the balance between parents and their children isn't really solvable in, in legislation. The idea is that you give parents the tools that they have in other contexts, um, but not so much online. Um, and But you can't solve for the parents' relationship with their children, how parents supervise the minors. And some of that is just going to have to be worked out on an individual family level. Um, we can't solve for that perfectly in legislation. Yeah, and I'd just also say that I think that, that tension is something that um, a lot of industry has exploited for a long time in order to prevent being regulated. Oh. Um, so, so that, that would just be, by, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, it, from my perspective, it's kind of worn out. I mean, if you look at, I think on the one hand, you know, we have a bill, the informed consumers that pass the house as part of the competes act. Um, and that would require verification of third party sellers on, on marketplaces, as well as disclosure when they hit certain level to sellers. Uh, we think that's a perfectly appropriate and, and correct thing to do to make a safer internet. At the same time, you know, we, are, we can as be supportive of anonymizing children's data, raising the age and all that. And those are not in, in, in conflict, despite, the, despite a constant refrain that they are on the part of industry. So we, we've come up on time. This has been a great panel. Just, just to put a couple of fine points um, on some of what we've heard, there was certainly a lot of urgency from the panel around uh, need for comprehensive privacy legislation, including greater protection for children. We heard about some of the trade-offs around uh, notice and choice in that model, as well as around a parental control um, model. Uh, so thank you all for joining us, and, and thanks so much to our panelists for all their terrific thoughts today.